Thank you and good morning and welcome to the Linus Rare Earths quarterly briefing for the December 2022 quarter. Today's briefing will be presented by Amanda Lacaz and joining Amanda are Garden Sturzenegger, Chief Financial Officer, Paul LaRue, Chief Operating Officer, Daniel Havas, VP Strategy and Investor Relations, and Sarah Leonard, General Counsel and Company Secretary. I'll now hand over to Amanda. Please go ahead, Amanda. Good morning, everybody. Um, I hope that, I guess I should start with Happy New Year uh, for those who um, celebrate a Lunar or Chinese New Year, Gong Si Fa Chai. Um, I hope everybody had a really lovely festive season um, and uh, have come back with enthusiasm and excitement for a great 2023. Um, so I'm pleased to have um, uh, lodged the, today's quarterly results. Um, you know, they were relatively, it was a relatively uneventful quarter, which was a delight after, you know, some of the challenges of the prior quarter, which of course we talked about in a lot of detail, including the catastrophic failure of water in, um, in Malaysia. Um, we did have a few, you know, sort of hangover challenges from that at the beginning of the quarter, um, but uh, we finished the quarter back at Linus Next Rates and um, look forward to being able to continue. Um, both of our operational sites performed really well, just as a, an interesting aside, we had uh, record um, a record quarter um, at Mount Weld um, and we are making some very good progress on ensuring that we really are optimising performance right through the uh, value chain from mine to um, big bags at the end of uh, the, the land facility. Um, we also made really excellent um, uh, progress on all of our major projects. Just as a refresher, that includes our big project at Mount Weld where we're um, expanding throughput by actually four times which expands our output over time by double. Um, we, we've got already um, Bolter's Works um, contractor has been mobilised um, we've started the procurement of the long lead time items. That project is prioritised in a way that, you know, we're making the investments that are um, you know, creating bottlenecks for our production today first. So we will release those bottlenecks with our objective being that we will be able to, you know, sort of progressively, you know, sort of move production up rather than just jumping from today to the um, uh, thousand tonnes a month, which is the target by the end of next year. In addition to that, um, you know, we are building our stockpile uh, the, for, for the Kalgoorlie facility. It will initially be fed with what we're describing as direct shipping ore, which is very high grade material, which we have segregated from the rest of the material. So there's not a constraint from the concentrator on our ability to actually build that, um, build that inventory to feed the Kalgoorlie plant. Um, Kalgoorlie itself really, um, our project manager, you know, is just telling me on Friday, it, it just is a fabulous time to be on site. I'm looking forward to being there next Monday. Um, when we uh, will be in Kalgoorlie, importantly, signing um, a, a cultural agreement with um, traditional owners associated with our Mount Weld facility. Um, but, but Grant tells me that every day there is something new to look at and it is very exciting indeed to be um, operating uh, at this time and seeing the huge progress, bearing in mind that, you know, it's, it's still less than 12 months from receive, 
receiving uh, full approvals for that site. And uh, we continue to work on uh, our, our US uh, process, uh, processing facility, um, making good progress on deliverables associated with that, uh, with, with, with that project. And then, of course, in Malaysia, um, we have some significant uh, development occurring to ensure that we can receive the mixed rare earth carbonate which will arrive from, um, uh, which will arrive, sorry, I'm looking at a chat here which is saying that someone can't get a question in. Um, so I shouldn't look at that, should I? Um, so in Malaysia, we've got a significant uh, project to um, receive the mixed rare earth carbonate from the Kalgoorlie facility. But as with all of our projects, we will take the opportunity to improve a number of other elements of our uh, processing um, facility, including in this instance, things like soda ash loading and unloading. Um, because if we're going to be making an investment in a new building and new capability, then it makes sense for us to use that opportunity to continue to improve efficiencies in our operations. So um, in terms of the business, um, the market continues to be very buoyant. Um, whilst the price was very stable through the quarter, uh, it started to pick up in, in December and uh, we continue to look into a market with strong demand and you know, really very um, good pricing uh, prospects for our business. And one of the other things which I think we sometimes, uh, you know, sort of un underestimate is, is we're not just an NDPR business. The value which comes from um, selling our other materials is important within our business. And you can see this when you look at the average price received over the quarter that whilst the NDPR price was relatively flat, our average price actually lifted up and that was a consequence of both the SEG pricing, heavy pricing remains very um, strong, but also um, uh, increasing sales of higher value add lanthanum and cerium materials. So a good quarter. Um, we're doing everything we can to make sure that the quarter that we're in is going to be an even better quarter. Uh, my colleague, Paul, has a uh, has a very um, popular saying within the business that we are uh, much worse, much better than yesterday, but much worse than tomorrow. And certainly, that's our objective: is to ensure that we continue to improve. But um, a good quarter, uh, pleased with it, pleased with the settings in the market, uh, pleased with our you know, what we've been able to deliver in terms of production and, and sales, and certainly uh, very pleased with the progress on, uh, you know, sort of our really very significant projects. Our first question comes from the line of Paul Young of Goldman Sachs. Please proceed with your question. Thanks, good morning. Morning, Amanda and team. Um, happy New Year as well, and I hope you're all going, going okay. Um, first question, um, is on um, the uh, the realised pricing. Um, um, so a good kick up in uh, in the realised pricing for the other products, Amanda, as you mentioned. Just on the on the seg pricing, it's a heavy pricing, and the the lanthanum cerium, um, the product improvement in product mix and pricing. Do you expect that to continue um, over the next couple of quarters and into the medium term? Um, I think that we think that the uh, heavy rare earth price remains very uh, uh, positive and we would expect that that will continue and uh, we would hope that we will continue to improve the contribution from our lanthanum and cerium materials as we increase the amount of higher value added material that um, we sell. Okay, all right, so we should assume for modelling purposes a, a bit of a continuation on that, on that dollar per kilo on the other the other other products in that case. Thanks for that. Um, 
The next question, Amanda, is on, on um, projects um, and some good progress on the Kalgoorlie cracking and leaching in the, in the quarter. Um, um, just observing, I guess, again, the pictures on, on some of the key items there and, and just sort of trying to match that with the, you know, the 1st of July deadline. I'm um, just wondering if you could just step through, you know, um, internally um, or when you expect, you know, first carbonate production from Kalgoorlie um, and just talk through maybe the ramp up and just how that sort of matches again um, with um, discussions with the Malaysian government. And, and just on that, if you can just maybe just talk through the new Malaysian government, um, you know, how they've been um, uh, or how recent discussions, if you had some, have gone with respect to, you know, potentially extending the permit um, on the cracking and leaching um, uptime or, or operations, I should say, in Malaysia um, beyond 1st of July, sort of just to match with that, that ramp up requirements from Kalgoorlie. Yeah, so um, Paul, that was a question of very many parts. And uh, it would not surprise you to know that, you know, we have a huge amount of effort in the business focused on, um, you know, sort of this transitional period. Um, if, if we take first the situation in Malaysia, um, as I think we've indicated previously, it is a matter of public record it's disclosed by a previous minister that we have um, appeals for the removal of the four um, conditions that were applied three years ago to our operating licence. Um, you know, our position is very strongly that we have uh, um, we run a, a, a low-risk operation, we are a lawful company which is compliant with all regulations and we have never been involved in any sort of uh, health or environmental incident. Um, you know, the most compelling data that we have is now our 10 years of safe operation in Malaysia. So, um, of course, you know, governments change um, our, our advocacy has always been that decisions should be made uh, to ensure that we are treated fairly and equitably um, uh, and that our performance is recognised. So when the AELB does their order to our operations in Malaysia, we have consistently been rated as very satisfactory, which is the highest um, level which is available. And all that we seek from government is that decisions are fact-based, um, not, not actually made on the basis of some of the alarmist statements from some activist groups, um, which even the IAEA has said uh, have no basis in scientific fact. So um, we continue to engage with both the regulators and also with the government. Um, as, as recently as last month, we had a delegation from uh, Malaysia come to visit our site in, in uh, Kabuli. So um, you know, we we have never um, pretended that we can forecast timelines that governments may choose, um, but we are you know, uh, actively engaged with, as I said, both the government and the regulators. Um, in terms of, you know, sort of feed on and ramp up in uh, Kalgoorlie, um, you know, we have our own targets, which of course are all about ensuring that we will be able to bring that facility online, um, but we are also looking to opportunities where we can ensure that we have you know, sort of safety stock as, as required um, as we manage um, potentially a transition period. Okay, thanks, Amanda. So, can I, can I just clarify one thing? Is, is, is one of the options or that you're planning for a um, a transition period, it sounds like it is as far as, you know, um, having to run LAMP below capacity, um, you know, as, as Kalgoorlie wraps up? Um, look, we've got a number of scenarios and we're preparing ourselves for all of them, right? The best possible scenario is one where we're running two facilities, which gives us a straight up uplift in, in the ability, um, you know, in, in throughput. 
um, uh, right through to one where we are required to close down one facility and operate the other. So, so we're managing a number of different scenarios and um, you know, it will be clear long before the 1st of July which, which of those we will be required to um, execute. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Daniel Morgan of Marinjoy. Please proceed with your question. Oh, hi, Amanda and Tim. Uh, the plant clearly exited December at a very strong run rate, and I think you said earlier that you're looking for Linus next rates to be achieved, um, which is about 1,800 tonnes a quarter of NDPR. Is, is that what you anticipate for the next few months or next couple of quarters um, for your for your throughput, or is there any major maintenance or anything else that might impact um, being able to run at that rate? Um, not every month will be the same um, because, of course, some months have 31 days and some months have 28 days. Um, but running at around about 7,000 tonnes a year is always our objective and um, we're just pleased that you know, we're, <coughs> we're at that sort of run rate at present um, but we are always you know, sort of cautious about making um, strong predictions on this given some of the impacts that external factors can have on the business. Thank you. Uh, and um, just on Kalgoorlie, uh, the plant, which obviously I can see progress there, um, just wondering your expectations once everything is in place and the plan is complete, how long do you think it takes to ramp up and commission the plant to full capacity? <laughs> um, I think that uh, that will not be absolutely clear until we um, commence operations in that plant. Suffice to say that we have a really um, strong commissioning team. Um, we have our operational team all on, all in place already in Kalgoorlie. It's a residential team um, writing processes, um, we will have all of the equipment properly tested before we commence and we have our significant um, uh, you know, sort of experience of operating a plant of this type in Malaysia. So we expect the ramp up time um, will be uh, assisted by that level of experience that we have. But um, at this stage, uh, we, we won't be disclosing any specific timeline on that. Okay, thank you very much, Amanda. Thanks, Daniel. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Al Harvey of JP Morgan. Please proceed with your question. Good morning, Amanda and team. Just following up on the licensing in Malaysia, I'm just trying to just want to confirm which works are actually underway. So, my understanding is there's the renewal for the entire facility due sometime around March 2023, and then the negotiations or your appeal on the the, the, um, the restrictions put on cracking and leaching for July is occurring in parallel. Just kind of trying to get a sense of whether or not you think that. Um, those two could come concurrently and if we're still expecting that before uh, March this year? Um, Al, I'm, 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 I've learned not to predict how either regulators or uh, governments may choose to proceed, uh, but you are right. On the, we, ha we operate under a, um, uh, an operating licence in Malaysia, um, the AELB, it, you know, we've had five of those issued over the period of time that we've been um, operating in Malaysia. And the AELB issues those licenses with, um, you know, well, we had a single set of conditions for the first 
you know, sort of uh, uh, seven, eight years of operation. And then we had, you know, sort of these additional conditions placed upon um, the operating licence in March 2020. Um, so our objective is to is and and our appeal is to have those conditions removed. Um, however, those conditions are not effective until the beginning of July. So you know one scenario may see us with our operating license renewed with the conditions in place. Another one may see us with the operating license renewed with the conditions removed. Um, and, uh, you know, as I said, we continue to engage both with the regulators and government um, and, and to prosecute our case very strongly for the fact that, uh, you know, we have operated safely for 10 years under a set of operating conditions and there is no scientific basis for making a change to those. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Amanda. Um, secondly, just a bit more detail on the, the water um, uh, reliability issues. Just wondering if, if the improvement is a reflection um, of a better performance of the pipeline. Is, is it seasonality or is it some of the backup measures you put in place um, over the last couple of months or a combination? I just want to try and get a sense of um, if and when we might see a return of um, water issues down the track. <laughs> well, the issue that we had in September was a catastrophic equipment failure. And so we haven't had, you know, sort of a, a, an equipment, we haven't experienced an equipment failure of that magnitude in the time that we have been in Malaysia. You know, it was a big pipeline that burst and it was, you know, 10, I think it's 10 metres underground and, you know, it affected everybody, um, residential, industrial, everyone. So um, it would be our hope, and I am sitting at a wooden table, so I'm touching wood, that this will not occur again. Um, in terms of some of the other issues associated with um, our supplier pipe, um, there have been a variety of different issues over time which we have generally been able to mitigate, which may be associated with pumping, you know, the pumping station or another time we had an issue with a bund wall which failed. But generally we have been able to mitigate those issues. Um, but we continue to work on um, projects which will see us um, you know, not have to use as much water. I mean, this is consistent with, with, with best practice sustainability practices, so we certainly want to be doing that. Um, and so that includes um, opportunities to recycle water and some rather exciting, you know, sort of further developments on that. But they are not short term. Um, fixes, so we do continue to have our uh, pipeline to the local, um, uh, you know, sort of pit which fills up with water when it rains, and it's rained a lot in the last three months. But pipe water supply has been um, consistent now um, across the quarter, and and we really haven't had to rely on some of those other initiatives. Right. Maybe just a final one before I pass on. Um, just want to understand if there's any um, potential for you guys to provide a, a reserve update sometime this year on Mount Weld. I guess just really pretty keen on getting the, the split of contained rare earths and uh, um, at the deposit and how that changes with depth. Um, I guess we haven't seen a, a split out in a, in a reserve or resource statement for a little while, so any update there. Um, uh, yes, well, we will do, at a minimum, we'll do a reserve update as part of our annual um, report because, of course, we're required to do that. Um, we have a whole team um, working on, you know, sort of def on defining the carbonatite um, on re reserve um, or resource in the first instance. Um, so that work continues. I don't expect that we will be finalising that within the next six months. 
Um, but in addition to that, we are doing a lot more um, you know, drilling um, as part of preparation for our next um, mining uh, cutback um, and you know, to more accurately uh, define the reserve. So, you know, when Linus first started a decade ago, more, more than that, say 14 years ago in, in Mount Wells, um, we had really good drilling in quite a small area of the ore body in, in what we call, you know, in the central lanthanide deposit. And we had a lot of other uh, drill areas where it was relatively um, sparsely drilled. Now we are progressively drilling through um, different areas to properly flesh out our understanding of the ore body. The other thing which you know we are working on is we have a four percent cut off cut off grade, which you know of course is sort of pretty um, amazing compared to some of the uh, other deposits um, which are being developed. And so we are doing some further work to really understand whether that which was set once again very early on in the process of development of the Mount Weld ore body, whether it is, whether it remains the economic, um, economically optimised to be uh, have a cut off grade at that number, or whether we should be looking at um, a different uh, cut off grade. So we do have a lot of work going on in terms of both geology and mining. And yes, we will be providing uh, both resource and reserve updates, but um, we don't expect that we will have completed the carbonatite work by the time we do the next substantive update, but we believe that we will have substantive information related to the reserve um, as it is currently um, con you know, uh, conceived. Does that make sense? Yep, I might come back with a follow-up, but I'll I'll pass it on for now. Well, I'd be happy Al, to you know sort of um, facilitate a discussion with our with, with our Mount World team to provide some more detail. I guess suffice to say that you know as a business we seek to always have um, a long um, life uh, reserve, and so. The work that we are doing, drilling both within the current uh, deposit and also at depth, is all part of ensuring that we have that that we maintain, um, you know, sort of that 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 long life. Right. Yeah. Definitely love to be able to uh, pick the pick the brains of the metal team. Um, just well, while I've got you, I might just throw in one last question. Um, just thinking about markets and Chinese production quotas, I assume we're probably going to get another a six monthly update pretty soon. Um, have you, you or the team, got any views on on whether they'll they'll um, likely increase those uh, the output there, noting that they put up by about twenty to twenty five percent over the last couple of years? Um, I might actually pass that over and let Paul answer that. He's much closer to that than I am. Um, yeah, good morning. Um, well, first on the production quotas, you remember that last year, combining first and second half, the production quotas led to around 20%, a bit more than 20% increase. And that was balanced with the demand increase. So that reflects in a fairly stable price. Um, next production quotas, I expect it to be released after the lunar year, but um, it's a bit like uh, with any regulators, there is no, no, no one knows what will be. Um, I believe it will still be in line with the variation of demand, but that's all I can say on this. All right, thanks very much, team. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Austin Newman of Macquarie. Please proceed with your question. 
Oh, hi, Moni, um, Amanda, and the team. Um, yeah, congratulations on the uh, strong quarter result. Uh, two questions from me, please. The the first one is on the uh, price realization. Just wondering if you could provide a bit more color on that uh, new uh, lanthanum and serum um, specialty product you developed. Like, uh, how much of the um, the price premium can you get um, for this product? I'll come back with the second one. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, once again, I like to pass over to Paul for that because this is an area of passion for Paul. <laughs> yes, um, it's a very complex question to answer. Um, I would say that uh, we focus on uh, adding value to basically cerium product mostly and lanthanum as well, but cerium number one. And um, so it's, you can check when you run the numbers, you can uh, analyze the premium. Uh, it was, it's already substantive. Uh, we, we have a lot of work and um, uh, a plan of development for a lot more added value, but as usual, uh, the more complex target you target, the more time it takes. So this will, uh, this will continue over the next, I would say, years. Um, but definitely, it's a very important KPI for us. Uh, and that's why we reinforce our, our R&D pool to develop a new product, new application in the Cerium, basically Cerium area, which will continue to be in oversupply for quite a while. But for numbers, sorry, I can't. I can't really uh, give you numbers precisely. It's substantial. No worries. Thank you. Um, the second one is on the um, the cost um, inflation. Just wondering, Amanda, how are you managing the uh, the cost inflation pressures um, at the uh, Mount World and the Kakuli project? Um, I mean, in this reporting season, we see uh, many companies reporting higher costs. Um, so it seems like this inflation pressure um, uh, is uh, kind of uh, uh, staying with us. Um, yeah, so we we did provide a, an update uh, last time on the fact that a combination of um, uh, growth in scope and also cost uh, escalations at Kalgoorlie saw so us update from. 500 to five, I think it was 575 mil, but basically a 15% um, um, uplift, bearing in mind that that was a combination of both costs and scope changes in um, the facility. Um, yeah, we see pressures across all of the business, but you know, we're paid to manage those. So we focus on ensuring that we continue to deliver efficiencies. So if unit costs go up and they're unavoidable, well, our task is to implement um, projects which will see us improve the efficiency of operations. You know, whenever we think about costs, we think about how do we do things better because if we do if we do things better and we reduce waste, then costs will um, inevitably um, come down as a result. So um, we do have escalation of costs, um, but we also have improvements in efficiency, and uh, we've not had to take any you know sort of um, significant actions to you know, drive cost out of the business. In fact, quite the opposite. You know, we, we continue to grow um, our investment in the business because we're facing into such a strong growth market. Um, so, you know, when we look at our costs, we certainly see two or three big contributors to cost escalation. And uh, at Mount Wells, of course, a huge one of those is energy and, and, and increase in, in diesel costs. Um, we are working on alternate energy solutions for our Mount Wells facility, 
which over time will drive um, you know, sort of costs out of the business, we believe. Um, and, you know, in, in, in Malaysia, say for example, uh, you know, we see, we've seen really significant increase in sulfuric acid prices, you know, which had been stable for a very long period of time. Once again, it's not something which is avoidable in the short term, but continuing to enhance um, efficiency, continuing to improve recoveries will mitigate to some effect the, uh, to some extent, the effect of those price increases on the uh, business performance. Thank you, Amanda. I'll pass down. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Reg Spencer of Canaccord. Please proceed with your question. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, Amanda and Paul and that uh, team. Um, I'll start with Malaysia if I can. I uh, presume I'm sure you guys will have seen the, the press last uh, week uh, relating to uh, a decision on the extension of your license conditions in Malaysia. That press uh, referred to a potential decision uh, by the government early next month. Um, I'm not sure whether or not you'd be willing to uh, comment on that, but uh, can I have a go anyway? I'd love to you to comment on that. Oh, look, you know, um, don't believe everything you read in the press, but in this instance, as we've disclosed previously, our operating license is due for renewal on the 2nd of March. Um, so we do expect that we will have some indications from the regulator with respect to that operating license renewal. Um, certainly no later than the 2nd of March. Okay, thanks. Um, speaking with Malaysia again, uh, just confirm something for me then. So your annual concentrate import uh, limit gets reset. Is that reset at the end of year? Such that set. regardless of the F. Sorry, uh, such set. that regardless of the F. Sorry, Rach, regardless of what? I did the outcome of, of the, um, uh, the, the operating conditions, uh, operating license conditions uh, would provide you with enough concentrate to get you through the, the ramp up of Kalgoorlie. So, so you're working now to build up that concentrate uh, of, uh, for the next six months or whatever that time might happen to be. Um, look, we, we, we have a series of conditions associated, of standard conditions associated with the license, which includes the amount that we can import, the quantity which can be stored on site at any given time. Um, you know, at various times we've been able to get variations to that, like particularly through the pandemic, where we had sort of variability in the amount which was delivered and when it was delivered. Um, and, and we also have conditions associated with the amount that can be processed. Um, we manage within all of those conditions, and so without trying to, you know, sort of um, make it too complex, you know, there's, as I said, you know, there's a series of conditions. We manage to those conditions, um, and yes, one of them is associated with the amount that we can import. And uh, yes, it does uh, reset on the 1st of January each year. That's useful. Thanks, Amanda. I'll, I'll pass it on. Thanks, Rach. Thanks, Rach. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Dim Aria Singh of UBS. Please proceed with your question. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda and team. Look, just a quick one from me. Um, I was just hoping you can reconcile, help me reconcile some of the numbers. So CapEx for this year, you've guided previously towards 600 mil, and then there was a CapEx creep uh, for Cal, as you reported on last quarter. So that takes it to 675. I'm just trying to reconcile that with the cash spend of 240 for the half. Do you expect the second half to be um, more heavily backweighted or... Um, just walk me through that, thanks. 
Yeah, sure. And I'm happy to let that in to add a bit more onto this as well. But yes, this is this is cash. Um, we're now um, committed almost fully uh, in terms of purchase orders associated with the Card Early project. And so this is just a timing issue um, as you know to when it actually goes out. But notwithstanding guidance, if we don't have to pay something, we don't pay it just to um, stick with the timeline. But Gadens, maybe you'd like to say something more to the uh, capital profile. Yeah, uh, good morning, uh, everybody. I think on the capex, what you can really see is uh, on the particular on the cash side an increase in uh, spend uh, level, which obviously follows the the commitment CPOs which which are out in the in the uh, market. I think the last quarter uh, was above 140 uh, million, and the quarter before 100 million. So you see a clear trend, and I would. Uh, well, I, I would. I'm, I'm, I'm very sure we, we see uh, the trend to con uh, continue. So, particularly the next uh, two quarters will be uh, quite high, uh, in, uh, specifically in regard to the uh, Kaguli project, which logically makes uh, makes sense. On demand uh, uh, wealth uh, expansion program, we will see. Um, a ramp up uh, as well, but on a much lower uh, lower level at this point in time. Right. Okay. Cool. Thanks. And just um, what? Yeah. What, when can we expect to get up to Cal and um, do more than a drive by or something that works? Or uh, <coughs> yeah. Frankly, we have a huge number of contractors on site. We wouldn't even take you onto the site right now because, you know, just managing the traffic with the contractors on site is a challenge in and of itself. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, I, I can't answer that, but, but I'll, I'll I'll have uh, Daniel come back to you with some estimates on timing, but you know it certainly won't be whilst we've got you know sort of hundreds of people actually um, building stuff. Um, so it's going to be a, some months before we would be able to have visitors on site. Oh, that's great. Okay, cool. Thanks, guys. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Paul Young of Gorman Sachs. Please proceed with your question. Thanks, hi Amanda. A, a few follow-ups from me. Um, just on your uh, ex-Malaysian and, and actually downstream strategy, um, just wondering if you can expand on the comments on the US refinery. I know you said that you made good progress on, on deliverables. Just wondering, you know, what that is. Has construction actually started? Have you selected the, you know, I, the site? Um, and um, yeah, so just just after a bit more information on the on the US refinery progress, thanks. Yeah, we've identified a site. It's on the Gulf Coast. Um, we're working with uh, uh, various levels of government on finalising um, that uh, position. It, uh, we think that it's a very good site for the plant because it's within an already industrialised uh, area, has good services, has access to very good um, and skilled labour. Um, with respect to engineering, detailed engineering and design, that's um, you know, been completed, but now we're working with you know, so the outsourced engineering team. I mean, we think we've had some fairly um, challenging inflation of costs in Australia. Well, in the US, it's been, you know, at Australian levels plus some. So um, we uh, have uh, populated more of the team with both, with both internal and external resources. Um, it's it's that stage where there's nothing much exciting to see, but all of the heavy lifting in terms of you know, sort of planning and and um, you know, design development, all of those sorts of things. That's where we are right now. 
So okay, not that's very helpful. exciting uh, for everybody outside, but quite exciting for the project team. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Understood. Thanks, Amanda. Um, and um, just your comments around uh, engagement or incoming inquiries from OEMs um, and uh, non-China Magna facilities um, for for offtake. Um, that, that's that's really interesting, and and um, I guess the question I have is around, you know, of the twelve thousand tons of NDPR you want to produce, how much actually is um, is actually not contracted? So I guess outside the Chinese and Japanese contracts. Okay, so I'll just hand over to Paul to answer that question. Well, uh, I can make a very simple question uh, answer. Um, since our production capacity currently is six hundred tons. A month, uh, we don't contract over our capacity. So the day we are 1,200, that would be 600 tons a month additional to contract. Because um, people won't sign a contract and a promise that um, that you will send their produce. They want to see evidence. Sometimes they sign MOU with a company saying they will produce race sometime in future, but it won't go to a contract level. So. Um, the answer is very simple, and um, and we just have a queue of uh, OEMs um, and uh, and lots of discussion and going with them for uh, for securing the supply of rears. In addition to that, anyone who has a project for uh, magnet making outside China today comes to Linus. So that's why um, because we are the only ones supplying NDP outside China, and so all in all. We are not short of demand. Uh, I would have to say that we should have supply, but <laughs> that's my problem as well. So yeah, Paul, thanks, Paul. Short, uh, the short answer is we don't sell anything in the spot market. Yeah, no, I understand that. Yeah, it's just from a volume volume perspective on a percentage terms versus the you know Linus 2025, the upsize plan. So that, that but that what Paul just said is very helpful. Last question I have, Amanda, is just on you know I mean this industry everything is developing so quickly. Um, you know every quarter, you know from a uh, you know downstream perspective, the magnet industry is changing very quickly um, and will change very quickly. Um, you know over the next couple of years. Um, from perspective of government funding, but also involvement by OEMs, you see what MP Materials has done, but also new entrants across the value chain. Are you interested in, you know, is, is one of your, you know, things you're looking at, you know, potentially getting funding from OEMs or even or even actually getting involved in magnet making? Um, at this stage, we don't have a um, uh, gap in funding, so, you know, we're, we're not specifically looking for um, additional funding sources. Um, in terms of do we extend into further downstream activities, um, we have a continuing watching brief on that um, and have done quite a lot of work really on, on what are the opportunities, what that might they look like, um, how could they be executed. Um, right now, um, and the last time we did, you know, sort of a, a full review on this, we can get bigger bang for our buck for our shareholders by increasing um, output than we can by um, diverting attention into some of the the downstream activities. And you know, we are. Um, one of the hallmarks of our success is that we focus on doing things, completing them, and then moving to the next one. So right now we have a very, very full agenda with um, the Mount World expansion with Kalgoorlie, with the further development of the Malaysian facility and with the US. But um, yes, we have uh, on work ongoing with respect to downstream development, which we will brief at an appropriate time. Okay, thanks Amanda, very interesting. I'll, uh, I'll leave it there. Thanks. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Al Harvey of JP Morgan. Please proceed with your question. Thanks. Thanks for the follow-up. Um, maybe following up with with Paul. Just you mentioned you 
you know, Chinese quotas could could come in line with um, demand growth. Just wanted to get a, a sense of where you guys are seeing, um, you know, your your forecasts for uh, demand growth in 2023, and then then maybe out on a on a five year view if you've had any substantial changes since uh, you've last uh, mentioned those things. Um. Okay, so short-term growth 2023 for us, um, uh, we are more than fully booked with our existing contract. Um, and uh, the growth, especially in electric cars, continue to be very strong uh, with a bit uh, better or slightly improved situation on the semiconductors um, supply, which has been uh, cutting a bit of the growth last year. Um, on the long run, definitely uh, this will continue. So we're talking about uh, double-digit growth for the next uh, five years at least, unless there is uh, something like a global financial crisis that we experienced uh, a few years back. Um, the question being where where will this demand come from? Is it from China or is it from uh, outside China? And that's um, that's the game that's, that is being played at the moment. Um, who will be the leading country for electric cars? And there is a lot to do in the West to uh, to not uh, to not lose um, this fight against uh, China. Or, yeah. And that that is that is yet to be seen. We we don't see uh, we see a lot of announcement of magnet new magnet projects. Uh, so far uh, outside China, I've seen only one uh, new factory in Vietnam from Shinitsu, but that's that's an existing magnet maker, and that's a very excellent customer of Linus. But uh, that's the only one who did actually uh, increase production outside China so far. So we'll see. All right. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, team. So we're about five minutes from the end. So if anybody else has a question, now's a good time. Otherwise, um, I would once again thank you all for your interest and look forward to seeing um, you in person um, as we move through the year.